The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. This is Leon Charney for Direct Line Israel USA in Jerusalem at the Prime Minister's building, specifically in the office of Azer Weitzman, considered one of the leading uh, architects of peace in Israel during the Camp David period, a founder of the modern Israeli Air Force, and today the, considered the best ambassador by Israel to all the Arab nations. Azer, last night, allegedly, a government was. Uh, form to come together between Likud and Labor? How do you feel? 50-50. Uh, uh, what this country sh uh, should have had now is uh, a government that knows firmly what it wants and has no uh, inside internal currents contradicting each other, which we have. But uh, thank God we're a democratic country and this is the way the people voted. And therefore, considering uh, uh, other alternatives, this is the best alternative. When uh, the two big problems we have to face, one is uh, how to make peace with the Arab world, and the other one is uh, economics and internal problems of the country. On the second one, I think that this government can have uh, most of the answers. On the first one, I, uh, there's a lot to be desired. December 14th, 1988, last Thursday, mm -hmm. the United States agreed to commence talking with the PLO. Is this a watershed day for the state of Israel? Uh, it's a turning point. It's the beginning of a new era in our um, big uh, quest for, for peace. And uh, I, most of my life I fought the Arab world. Some of my life I made peace with the Arab world. I had the pleasure of writing a book uh, titled The Battle for Peace. And um, people sometimes talk about a battle only when you shoot at each other. To achieve an understanding between each other, it's a hell of a big, a big battle, too. And I think it's the beginning of an interesting campaign that I look at it favorably. I think the United States did the correct thing, considering the change or the hopeful change in the PLO, which also, I hope, came to realize that uh, with guns and bombs and, and weapons, you don't always achieve everything. And uh, the 14th of December was a turning point and a beginning of a possibility of a new era. Aza, you wrote two books, one uh, on eagle's wings, which regaled in the military might and superiority of, uh, of the Israeli nation as a, as, a, as a military force, and you were the founding father of the modern Air Force, and you were considered uh, one of the military heroes. Zip, you come around, and another book becomes a bestseller, Battle for Peace, and there, you're the fighter for peace. And people, some people, consider this a, a massive turnaround of you as a person. Was that really a massive turnaround or yes. a growth? Well, it was a development. And, and uh, people always talk about revolutions, which are always very interesting. But you have to analyze the evolution that brought revolutions. Uh, the Russian Revolution didn't just, boom, erupt one day in 1917 or, or other changes. Uh, the American uh, War of Independence didn't start boom one day. There were reasons and, and developments towards it. Uh, if I may uh, put my little self into a, a, a similar situation, we had to fight for our life. We had to fight for the existence of Israel. We had to prove to the Arab world that they cannot uh, lick us in battle. We had to prove to ourselves that we can do it. Well, people always uh, look at us as, uh, as, as great warriors, um, without knowing, without even going deeper into the problems of the doubts and the, the uh, questions, can we make it, can we do it, can the Jews fight, can young Israelis fly <coughs> fighter planes, can we have an Air Force like uh, uh, grown up, like grown ups, and uh, there's a long, long story of how the Israeli Air Force grew up from uh, Piper Cubs to F-16s. I have an F-16 here on the wall with my son-in-law pushing, pushing it all the way up. 
and uh, um, it's, it's a story on its own. Therefore, the first book on eagles' wings, rights of uh, how to it's make a bestseller in Israel. I think it was a bestseller in Israel. Yes, and um, the main the main story there. It's an autobiography. Is uh, to put it in a nutshell, is how to make war. At a young age, though, autobiography. It was only half your career. It, it was, was an autobiography till uh, 1974, 75. Uh, I don't know. People always say, "May you live to 120." Uh, you wish everybody to live to to 100 and feel like 20. So I don't know whether I feel like 20 now, but I definitely don't feel like uh, like 100. So the first book was a book of how to make war, uh, mainly in the air force. And the second one is how to make peace. And believe you me, it's just as difficult and thrilling. Aza, you're considered one of the architects of the Camp David Peace Treaty, mm -hmm. along with uh, obviously Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister, and uh, Moshe Dayan. Mm -hmm. uh, a peace initiative with Arafat, will it be as difficult as Camp David or more difficult? More today? difficult. More difficult because, um, number one, we talk to a sovereign country. Here we're talking to uh, a force that looks for an entity, uh, a nation, a people, call it whatever you want, but they look for an entity. And the first question is, <coughs> what sort of an entity is it going to be? Uh, number two, um, a solution is um, um, a solution is very close to, to, to Israel itself. If we do give up, and I think we will give up uh, part of the Western Bank, not all of it, um, I would like to remind you that 242 talks about withdrawal from territories occupied in 1967, not all the territories or the territories, but definitely a compromise with the, whoever we're going to talk to on the future of the Western Bank, um, real estate-wise, and, uh, and the Gaza Strip. This is much closer to home, and therefore the decision is much more difficult. Um, number two is that uh, we came to Israel being our uh, land of our ancestors. And there's a big national uh, argument of what is Israel, what is bigger Israel, what is the meaning of uh, Shechem, which is known as Nablus, what is the meaning of Hebron to, um, to the essence of, of Israel. Do we give it up? Don't we give it up? Uh, and therefore, the argument amongst ourselves, the discussion among ourselves, uh, to the, to the Sanusual, to, to, the, to the real final status of the Western Bank in Gaza, and using Kim David language, is going to be far more difficult than with the Egyptians. Jerusalem. Can there ever be a compromise on Jerusalem? No. No. There can be only municipal arrangements and religious arrangements, but the, uh, Jerusalem is the capital of, the, of, of, of Israel. The people of Israel seem to be very nervous, petrified, <coughs> insulated, insular uh, about <coughs> this uh, Arafat initiative and the United States uh, feeling about it. Uh, it seems to be sort of a ghetto mentality, although one cannot blame them for feeling that way. Do you feel that way, sir? I don't feel that way. And uh, if a people feel the way you describe, and I don't argue with you about the description, you should blame the leaders and not the people. And uh, instead of standing up and saying, look, we have a strong country. We have, uh, first of all, politically, the United States with us which is not only politically, but economically and militarily. We fly now an Air Force that is 100% American. We fought the Six-Day War with 100% French aeroplanes. We didn't have a single American fighter plane. In 1948, we had no support whatsoever from the United States. I went to communist Czechoslovakia to pick a few Messerschmitt 109s to fly against Egyptian Air Force flying Spitfires. Neither England or France, or, uh, or England, in, neither England, France, or the United States helped us with uh, with anything. It was behind the Iron Curtain that we got our weapons and uh, the guts we got ourselves. Now we are fully Americanized in the Air Force 100%. Grant forces, all our tanks, be them uh, locally made or, or bought in the United States, are run on American engines, etc. Uh, we get uh, quite uh, support financially, financially, both for defense and economics. Three billion dollars a year, 1.8 goes for defense. And therefore, um, I say, when I speak publicly, and I speak the same uh, to the Israelis as I speak to you now on, on American television, uh, that we have strength, moral strength, definitely. We have a beautiful Air Force. We have a very good army. We have a neat, a nice, and tidy little Navy. 
we uh, have uh, command, leadership in the army, and control. And therefore, from a point of uh, security, I don't want to, to use the word strength, um, including political, as I've said, America, and we can come later on on what happens with the Soviet Union, what is happening with the world today, a changing world that does not want to see local wars that have to be fed by, by, by either the United States or the Soviet Union. The United States is, 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 not, is, is paying a lot for our battles, and the Soviets are paying a lot for their battles. And uh, therefore, I think that uh, there shouldn't be a feeling of insecurity. There should be a feeling of pride that after, all, after so many years, another Arab uh, enemy wants to talk to us, and the, the main and the prime enemy, and not always feel that we're going to be diddled, we're going to be done behind every bush as an enemy, and the whole world is against us. And let's assume that someone has that feeling. Let's sit down and talk and find out. And if he's a liar, shoot him. If he's not, shake hands with him. So you're really saying what you need now is strong, strong leadership to calm the people down and to, to give them a vision of how the country should be led? 100 percent. Therefore, I say that the campaign for this peace, the battle for this peace, is a difficult one, but it's a battle. Aza, your uncle Chaim Weizmann, one of the founders of the Jewish state, first president of the Jewish state, <clears throat> had a vision of Zionism. Is his vision coming? Uh, to fruition? Not 100%. I believe that the vision of our elders, I'm talking back 100 years ago, um, had he been alive, he would have been now well over 110 years old. He was 50, I was 50 years younger than he was. Uh, I'm 60, almost 65, and he would have been now wow, about 115 years old. You don't look at it, sir. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I should have looked. I should have looked about 500 by, by you know, 500 years old. By what we go through sometimes, but thanks for the compliment. No, I think that his generation, including Ben Gurion and uh, and the and the Jabotinskys and the Sokolovs and all the great leaders that now are, are names of streets in most of the Israeli cities, um, they wanted to have an Israeli, a Jewish entity. Um, let's call a state that basically had security in three in three on three points: physical security, economic security, and traditional security. And if we're not careful, some Israelis might think, and some Jews might think, that these three ingredients are catered for beautifully in the United States. People for you feel more secure in New York than someone feels uh, in, a, in a settlement on the Western Bank or in, uh, in, in the old city of I'm Jerusalem. very comfortable in Jericho, yes, sir. You are very, very comfortable in very Jericho. Very comfortable. But you have to admit that you were more comfortable three years ago in Jericho. Last year. Or last shot year. A film there, yes. Okay. So I, I as, a, as a, a second generation of, of these leaders, second, third generation of these leaders, I was hoping that when I have two grandchildren, and I have three now, and two of them are sitting in their cockpit over there, that when they reach uh, the end of the century, they will have a secured Israel physically, a secured Israel economically. And traditionally, each on his own, the way he feels in the uh, tradition of, of, of Judaism. And uh, after 40 years of sovereign state, we haven't achieved it. To your specific question about my uncle, my uncle said once that Israel will be judged by the way she treats the Arabs, or by the way she lives with the Arabs. And he went back in the early 20s to see King Faisal of, of Iraq. And uh, I think that all these leaders knew that the, one of the main points is how Israel is going to find itself as a state in what I call the Middle East, but in this part of the world with 150 million Arabs, um, primarily Muslims, are we going to be part of it, or are we going to be an isolated entity that is very close to what you said before, an armed ghetto? And therefore his visions, if he, uh, if he rose today and saw what was happening, I don't think he'd be a happy leader. Do Zionism and Judaism coalesce, Azar? And isn't this not one of the problems that happen now with the religious parties? No, no, no. I don't think the problem is the religious parties. I think the, the religious parties add on to a few problems. I remember attending a dinner with you in Atlanta, Georgia, where you 
said that a person who lives in Israel is a Zionist, a person who supports Israel is a pro-Zionist, and what you were really trying to tell the people was that if you don't come to live in Israel, you're only uh, pro-Zionist and not Zionist. Correct, and there are a few anti-Zionists too. Many. Well, many. Uh, yes, I haven't changed my, uh, my, my, uh, the way I think from, from Atlanta. We went to synagogue together in Atlanta, if I right. remember correctly. Now, uh, are you disappointed uh, that more people don't come and live in Israel? Definitely, country? definitely. Uh, we fought the British. We, we, we had an argument with the British about the fact that the, the, the gates of Israel were closed, the gates of mandatory Palestine were closed to, to, to immigration, to immigration, of Jewish immigration, especially after the Second World War, 45, 6, 7. And there were British Navy chasing illegal immigrant ships to Israel. Now we thought we'll have our own state and uh, we'll uh, open the gates and Jews will pour in, and they don't. To me, this is the possibility of a failure. I would say it's, it is a failure because we are in, 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 in a certain, uh, at a certain stage. And therefore, I cannot understand a Jew who doesn't want to live in Israel. Uh, like I can't understand an Israeli who decides that he doesn't want to live in Israel. And if this happens now, at the end of the 20th century, where the beginning of the century saw political Zionism come to its own, Balfour Declaration 1917, uh, the first uh, uh, settlers 1882, if we now in uh, 1889, 1989, if we have problems with income, with immigration to Israel, and Israelis leaving, it's only ourselves to blame and ask ourselves, why is it that this country is not that attractive. One of the main reasons is that we don't have peace with the Arab world. Where do you see Israel 15 years from now for your grandchildren? Uh, may I have this book, please? I dedicated this book, and I say to my son Shaul, who fought and bears the scars of battle, to my son in Dubi, who is still fighting, so my grandson, Iftah, may never have to go to war. It's one of your answers. Egypt, today, 10 years, uh, in March, I guess, 10 years, Camp David, uh, we were all working hard to get this thing accomplished. Mm -hmm. How are relations today? Um, the relations are like between uh, um, relatives in the family who, um, who cross each other's path and, 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 and are cool to each other. They probably meet only on holidays, on Rosh Hashanah, Pesach. But all through the 365 days, he lives his life and you live your life, which is bad. Because, again, the future of Israel is whether we find a way uh, not only to have peace. What is peace? to be able to travel, to be able to have business, to be able to, 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 to appreciate each other with all the differences, with all the differences that one has. And therefore, to your specific question, which is a question that bothers me, um, is uh, that it is a cool piece. I don't say cool, it is a cool piece. And I, uh, one of the reasons why it is this way is because we did not pursue the Ken David Accords as we should have. And therefore, the Palestinian problem, after 10 years of signing the uh, Camp David Accords, which talks about Palestinian people, Palestinian problem, the necessity to solve it in all its problems, it's all written there, signed by Mr. Begin, um, by, by Jimmy Carter, and by the late Anwar Sadat. And, uh, and therefore, the relationship is, is cold, because Egypt didn't go to peace with us just to have a bilateral peace with us. They went to have a bilateral peace to us as the beginning of a new era in the Middle East, and the basic problem was to solve the Palestinian problem. And because we, 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 uh, uh, we cooled it off, and because we had a, had a stalemate politically for eight, nine years, this is why now, I believe, we'll get a, quite a pressure from the world to solve this problem. I remember when uh, you were a defense minister, uh, I believe you had a car accident, you were in a hospital, Sadat visited the Knesset, and you hobbled in on some crutches to, right. to meet Sadat. And did you feel at that point that there was going to be a breakthrough? What was your emotion at that point? There you are. This is the photograph of Sadat shaking hands with me. This was in Jerusalem in 1977, in November. 
uh, he arrived on the 19th of November, and he was a very, very, he was an interesting man. I think he was a great leader. Um, we had differences of opinion, but uh, we, uh, we struck a very interesting friendship. It's a story on its own. I, by the way, had the car accident on the 16th, and um, they told me later on that they thought that I was a super hook. And when they learned that I was not in the reception committee in Lod, and it was announced that I had a car accident, they thought it was just a story. And when he saw me, when he saw me uh, limping in, he, was, he told me he was very sorry to see me limping, but he was very sorry to see the whole story was incorrect. I definitely thought that it was a great uh, beginning of a new era, like, like now, with the differences of, of uh, the personalities and, and, uh, and the problems. What do you fight for in life? Why do you go to wars? You go to wars to have a better life. Anyone who, who fights just for the sake of, just for the hell of fighting, is, uh, is abnormal, is immoral. Anyone who has the understanding that he has to fight for what he believes in, and that the other side also has the belief that he fights for what he believes in, and then you come to an understanding with the other side that uh, had been an enemy, then I think this is a great achievement in strategy, and this is a great achievement in life. And if after um, so many years, almost 30 years, and I uh, was over Egypt most of my life, and my, uh, some of my best friends were killed fighting against the Egyptians. My uh, one and only son, I have a daughter who is married to a pilot, but my son is until today um, disabled from the wars with the Egyptians. Didn't prevent him, by the way, to going with me several times to Egypt. And when, after especially the October war, when we came to real loggerheads with the head on with the Egyptians, and we lost about 3,000 killed. And by the way, I'd like to remind the, you and the listeners, in the War of Independence in 1948, we lost 6,000 killed out of a population of 600,000. It's 1% of the population. God forbid if it would have happened to the United States today, in 18 months, it's 2.5 million people lost in battle. It's a hell of a wallop. And if after all this, and after what the Egyptians uh, went through too, because they got, they got a hiding from us, that their leader comes and says, no more war, and wants to talk business to us, I thought it was a great, great, great day. <clears throat> is, it, is it possible that that same emotion and uh, feeling that you uh, were able to achieve with Sadat, could that happen between you and, and Arafat? I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I hope, it, I hope yes, because I do believe that uh, uh, leaders of, of countries, and I don't consider myself the leader of this country, uh, one of the pack of leaders, there's a great importance in the relationship between the leaders. Look at what's happening between uh, Gorbachev and Reagan, and which I think is a, is a great achievement on, on the side of both leaders. I believe that something is happening in, in Russia. What is it that uh, Mrs. Thatcher said the first time she met Gorbachev? There's a man I could do business with. Um, there should be an effort on both sides of leadership to find what is in common, what can be a common denominator between the leaders of the countries, and not a priori say beforehand, he's a liar, he's a thief, he's only diddling, he's uh, actually he wants to destroy me. Hell does he want to destroy me? Anyone who throws bricks and anyone who throws bottles because he has no tanks and no airplanes. And, uh, but this is not the only reason with, where I hope to find a, a way to talk to PLO leadership. is because, going back to you first, to your, you, your question about my grandchildren. My grandchildren and the grandchildren of the leadership of the Palestinians will have to live together happily ever after. And therefore I see it as a great mission to find um, common language with Palestinian leadership, if it's necessary, Arafat, for the future of our grandchildren and theirs. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accords. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Named by the Foreign Policy Association as one of the top five documentaries of 2011. DVD now available on Amazon.com. 
Get the book that inspired the movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available exclusively from the publisher. Learn how groundbreaking history was made behind the scenes. Get the book for $19.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling or the 10-disc set audiobook for $34.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling. Call Barricade Books at 201-944-7600. That's 201-944-7600. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels now. Leon Charney's new book, The Battle of the Talmuds, is now available as an audiobook. This wonderful CD can be ordered directly from the publisher for just $29.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling. Listen as this audiobook explains how Judaism's greatest scholars broke from their own history and gave spirituality to a people without a homeland. And you can also get the audiobook version of Leon Charney's bestseller, The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get a detailed explanation of one of the oldest and most revered prayers in the Jewish religion as Charney's book explains how the Kaddish evolved. Both audiobooks are available directly from the publisher for $29.95 each, plus $12 for shipping and handling. Call 201-944-7600 and order with your credit card. That's 201-944-7600. Immerse yourself in Jewish history. How do you overcome the feeling in this country amongst a lot of the population that uh, Arafat is a terrorist, the killer, the murderer, the... I mean, you heard the same things about Sadat. Sadat was a Nazi collaborator and uh, obviously he wiped out plenty of Israelis. More than Arafat. More than Arafat. Because in, in a real battle where you should throw bombs and shoot guns, more people are killed. So then, your, your possible answer is that uh, you only make peace with your enemies and therefore one must try to make peace rather than keep throwing bottles? Would that be a correct statement? Very much so. A very correct statement. And you said correctly that there were quite a lot of skeptics about, about, about Sadat and about uh, President Mubarak that took over um, uh, after the unfortunate assassination. People see what people used to say about Mubarak. For instance, they said Mubarak is going back to the Arab world. What the hell did they expect him to go to Scandinavia? He is part of the Arab world. He's the, the one of the, the leaders of the Arab world. So, uh, and uh, if I may put my pennies worth into, into now, he's been running Egypt for seven years. What a very, very difficult situation. And he's it, brought Arab, uh, Egypt back to the Arab League, and he's now recognized by all of the Arab countries. He was ostracized when, good, when he went Good to show. Japan. I'd rather have a leader that has peace with us, uniting the Arab world, than a leader that doesn't have peace with us, uniting the Arab world. And uh, I think he's, uh, he'll probably go down in history as one of the great presidents, one of the great leaders of Egypt. I know him personally. By the way, he's a pilot too. He commanded the Air Force. In so is George Bush. George Bush was a Navy fighter pilot. That's why I think that he will succeed. Well, when you he, when he go into be a, a pilot, especially a fighter pilot, you must, you, must have it, uh, you must have it in you. I wish him all the best, uh, many happy landings. Um, so... Uh, I know that the country has a, uh, has a certain of latent fear. Again, I go back to leadership. Instead of the leaders coming and reminding everybody of how many were killed and how many were tortured and how many, which is a fact. It's one way of, of, of fighting, unfortunately. I would say, and I say so, and I say so in all public uh, uh, talks and I, I, in the papers, in Israeli papers, I'm being criticized about it and I'm being praised about it. This is a great chance to talk to leaders of a people that we have to live together till the cows come home. So uh, I would like to find out the good things in someone who fought against me. I, was, I came very close to, to one of my best friends in Egypt, is a, a man who was prime minister, General Kamal Hassan Ali, who has, first time we met, he went Johnson on me. He picked his shirt up and showed me a big scar here and said, this is, I got a present from your Air Force. I phone him now regularly to, to, to Cairo. Um, General Gamasi, who was uh, one of the planners of the October War, who fought us galore. We, uh, we became friendly as much as you can. Well, we had a breakfast one morning together at the Regency Hotel where we had the ambassador from Egypt uh, yourself and uh, I think... Uh, Badawi, uh, Mr. Badawi, Ambassador Badawi, 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 Badawi,
uh, during the Yom Kippur War, and everybody had injuries, everybody had death, and 10 years later, or 12, 15 years later, he was sitting having breakfast like, like cousins. Leon, Leon, my friend, on the very first dinner that uh, Prime Minister Begin gave to President Sadat in Jerusalem on the 20th of November 1977, 11 years ago, there was Sadat sitting there, lost a brother as a pilot in the October War. Yigal Yadin lost a brother as a pilot in the 48 War. Moshe Dayan lost a brother in the 48 War in the Grand Force. I was sitting there with a son who's disabled. He's uh, making great progress. And uh, each and every one, uh, a gentleman called Mr. Tuhami was sitting next to me, lost a brother and a brother-in-law. There was leaders of two countries that bled trying to find a way of no more war. I think that the same thing should be said to the people today about the Palestinians, especially after signing peace with Egypt and especially after signing Kim David, which I repeat and I'll repeat every time I can, that Mr. Begin signed on the dotted line to solve the Palestinian problem. I remember in the beginning of the uh, Sadat visit, you personally were for direct negotiations with Egypt and you did not really want to rely on the United States. Uh, I think your first instincts were first direct negotiations. What do I need an outside power telling us how to help negotiate out this treaty? And then I think you have a, you have a good memory. Uh, well, yeah, I've read your books. That's good. And, and then uh, you've come around to change, and uh, President Carter came into the to the goulash, as you would call it, and helped us along. Do you think the United States today uh, should play as positive a role as it is playing in this Arafat initiative? Do you yeah, think it's important? A hundred percent. After my experience with making peace with a sovereign country, and I said before, with an easier situation, and that I've come to the conclusion that I'd rather have peace uh, with American assistance than have no peace at all. And I quite often used to say, when people t t tell me, my political opponents, we want direct negotiation, I'll tell them, look, boys and girls, A, we didn't have direct negotiations in, uh, with the Egyptians, and Begin was a strong leader, and Dayan was no, uh, no chicken himself. Uh, we, uh, we went to, to Ken David, and the pe first peace between an Arab country and, and, and Israel was signed not in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, or Cairo, or Ismailia, or in the Sinai Desert. It was signed in Washington in the White House. White House lawn. In the White House <laughs> lawn. It was a shiny day, the sun was shining, and everybody was happy. And uh, believe you me, then I was hoping that 10 years hence I'll be sitting uh, looking at Israel with a, with a much uh, uh, more uh, optimistic uh, eye. But I did want to find a way to direct talks with them. We did have direct talks in Ismailia on the 25th of December, 77. And then we all came to a conclusion that a power like the United States can and should assist. It's interesting you say that everyone was happy, and the people in Washington were happy, but I remember a comment from you saying to me that there was not the same euphoria in Israel as you had expected or, or hoped for, that people were not that excited about the peace. It seemed like after the Six-Day War, when Israel was a victorious military uh, might, so to speak, there was more feeling in the street of euphoria than it was when there was a Camp David peace treaty signed and, and there was a possibility there'd be no yeah. more war. <laughs> Let's analyze the euphoric uh, situation. There was euphoria when Sadat arrived here. But then, and here, uh, I'm sorry if I'm being critical to people who cannot answer me. Again, the leadership, led by Mr. Begin, did not help convincing the people that this is the right move. The fact is that Sadat arrived in November 77, and peace was only signed 16 months later in March 70, uh, 79. Why? Because there was the, the, the haggling, and Sadat always used to tell me, why do you always haggle and haggle? He's had a, quite a heavy problem, the haggle and haggle. And there was a lot of haggling going on that they didn't understand. There was a lot of things happened from their side that we uh, didn't understand. But the leadership, like today, did not leap out of uh, out of old ideas and led the people to say, no, look, there's a new era now, we're giving up the whole of the Sinai, but we have peace with the greatest Arab country in the world, 50 million people, there's a chance for business, there's a chance for, for, for happier life, for tourism on both sides. Instead, we didn't pursue what we agreed to pursue, which is Kim David Accords, which came before the peace, 
meaning that we have to sit down, have free elections in the Western Bank in Gaza, form an a, 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 a administrative council that, that can form an autonomy, and for three to five years, let them be autonomous in the Western Bank in Gaza, and then decide on the future based on 242. I think that somewhere the leadership of Israel realized that by signing Camp David, they put the future of the Western Bank in Gaza for discussion, which is true, and some of them regretted it. Izzy, you were heir apparent to the uh, Likud uh, party as prime minister. You were riding the crest of a tremendous popularity poll. You were defense minister. Camp David had just been signed. Was that the reason you resigned? Definitely. I, uh, I resigned from, uh, from the Harut Many party. Many people say you gave up the prime ministership by doing that. Oh, who knows? I don't know. I don't know. Well, the, to be prime minister is, uh, I wouldn't say that I didn't want to. I wouldn't say that I didn't think that I could do it, but uh, the way things started going, deviating from King David, deviating from the peace, uh, leading the country, I thought uh, wrongly. I could have played an act, I could have put on an act, but then I wouldn't be able to shave in the morning and look me, myself straight in the eyes or cut myself while shaving. And you look well shaven today, Thank so you. your conscience is clear? It's more clear. Anyone who says he has a completely clean conscience, what do they say? I have a clean conscience. I never use the damn thing. Yeah. So uh, I can't say that I have a completely clean conscience, but it's cleaner than it would have been had I uh, uh, prostituted myself to political lines that I didn't believe in. You touched on it before, Aza, but I want to go back to it a little bit uh, more in depth because I think, it's, I think it's very important as an American, and I'd like to get your feeling as an Israeli leader. The Soviet Union has completely mm. changed. It's, uh, it's come what? into a relationship with the United States that very few of us believed. Reagan went in uh, in the first eight years of his administration, the first six years, saying the Soviet Union is our nemesis, our enemy, of, and uh, everything negative. And today, Empire of evil. Empire of evil. Uh, we need uh, stratosphere, ionosphere, we need Star Wars, Mar Wars, everything in the world. It's changed. He's okay. visiting Times Square. Right. This goes back to what we, we talked about before about evolutions. Uh, again, I wouldn't say that I, uh, I said so. I hate people saying I said so, but some of us had a feeling, I amongst them, uh, that there must be a change in the Soviet Union. It can't carry on. In a world that is becoming a world of media, that you can switch on a television and see what goes on 10,000 miles away from you, where the um, standard of life is going up. You, it was obvious that the, the Soviet Union cannot carry on the way they do with internal problems. And I'm not a great analyst of, 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 of the Soviets, but logically uh, it was uh, clear to some of us that things must change. Again, the skeptics say, ah, nothing will happen. Gorbachev will be just the same as Khrushchev and everybody else in Ilfu. I did my best to read as much as I could about him personally and about what goes on there. And I came to the conclusion three years ago that something new and something fresh and something definitely, as you say, 180 degrees to what has happened before is happening in the Soviet Union. I believe so. I believe that uh, the United States and the Soviet Union will find that they have lots of problems in common. Um, the East, the Far East, is, is, is rising. Japan, uh, Taiwan, Korea. China hasn't started yet on the potential, and it's a small country of one billion people going merrily on with a long border between the Soviets and the Chinese, and I think it's about something like 3,000 miles. Um, it's a changing world. It's a ch you don't have any empires anymore. You have uh, economics that influence the world. And the United States economically now is in a situation where South America owes it billions of dollars. Most of the treasures of America are in the Far East, in Japan and or, or, or Korea, some of it in Germany. The Soviet Union is definitely in economic uh, uh, situation worse than the United States. All these things, I hope, will get the two countries together, not only because of the negative thing, also because they don't want to blow themselves up. And Chernobyl is the writing on the wall. The feeling in Israel today is that uh, I sense what, what I call a Masada complex, and uh, this is after uh, last Thursday's initiative by the United States with Arafat, that uh, uh, we will just stand our ground, I'm talking as an Israeli and the, the ones that I've spoken to, and uh, if need be, we'll blow up the world with us. I mean, 
Does that sound sane to you, Hazer? Definitely insane. Definitely wrong. <clears throat> have you heard this, by the way? Well, I have my, I'm sitting in an Israeli government. Uh, I hear my colleagues. I don't have to go out to the street and ask people in the streets. I just have to listen to my colleagues in the government, including the inner cabinet, which I'm a member of. I do hope, I do hope that, uh, again, leaders of this country will convince the people that uh, Masada might have been a great thing in the history of the Jews, but it certainly was instrumental in putting the Jews for 2,000 years into exile. I think it's wrong. I think it's, um, as you said, what you said, insane. And I do hope that we'll find the leadership that will convince the people that for the beginning of the 21st century and a new era, one has to think differently. Azer, heroes. Heroes. Do you have heroes? Heroes, yes. Yes, well, I, um, meaning um, people that I, I admire. historically I admire. Right. Because hero is a, a lot of dead heroes, you know. Uh, cemeteries are full of dead heroes. <coughs> if we talk about peace and war, one of, the, one, of the, one of the generals that I admire from the Second World War, I never met him, is the late General MacArthur, who was very controversial. First of all, I think that he fought one of the best uh, campaigns fought by any general. If you can judge a campaign as a success compared to, to casualties and time consumed. And he was uh, hopping islands, etc. And I know that he's very controversial battle-wise. But when we talk about our situation today, there's a certain similarity. There was a man who knocked hell out of the Japanese. Hell! and led the United States forces uh, to victory. Okay, two atomic bombs, but uh, up to that. And then for five years, he led Japan. And he's the man, I think historically, will be uh, uh, judged for what he did as, 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 the, as the... Rebuilding. Of the rebuilding and, and pushing for the first time democracy into Japan and into, to put democracy into Japan was more difficult than into Germany that had experiences with democracy because this was, Japan was, I don't have to analyze what Japan was until 1945. And here we have Japan as a democratic country today, uh, highly influential in the world, economically strong, technologically up and above, always. What is it uh, some Japanese leaders are, are reputed to have said? Next time we shall buy Pearl Harbor. And, uh, Maybe coming, sooner you think. Could be. And to <coughs> me, a man like this who, who fought against them and then saw the necessity for the future, and he saw ahead, is to rebuild a democratic Japan. To me, he is a great hero. General Marshall? Okay, I was, I was, I was coming to that. Uh, another gentleman who probably uh, didn't have the same reputation as MacArthur and actually battles in the field because he was the chief of staff of all American forces named after him as the big plan of rebuilding and reconstructing uh, Europe, the Marshall Plan. And he became Secretary of State. To me, these are the two military uh, uh, people that, considering what has happened to me and what has happened to this country, they're two great heroes. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accords. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Named by the Foreign Policy Association as one of the top five documentaries of 2011. DVD now available on Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available exclusively from the publisher. Learn how groundbreaking history was made behind the scenes. Get the book for $19.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling, or the 10-disc set audiobook for $34.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling. Call Barricade Books at 201-944-7600. That's 201-944-7600. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels now. Who are the great uh, political leaders in the world today, Azer? I, I would say that uh, I would say that uh, not in, in, in priority. I would say that Gorbachev is probably the greatest leader because he's got the most difficult task, 
And then again, you analyze leadership by the difficulties they, 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 are, they are confronted with and the way they solve it. And to do what he did, I think, needs lots of guts and, and, and leadership qualities. The other one is uh, the Iron Lady, Mrs. Thatcher who again took England in a certain situation and is changed it and is, will go down in history as a prime minister, I think, that has the longest, the longest uh, uh, serving time as prime minister. I would say that uh, President Reagan, uh, that I wish him all the very best now on, on after eight years, proved uh, that, um, that, that, that there's, again, I think, I, I think that he was a leader for eight years, again in a difficult situation. I think that President Bush uh, will have a difficult time because economics again in America are not so hot and uh, in a changing world, but I, as I've said before, he being a former Navy fighter pilot, I think he'll make it. Quick comments about a few uh, past and uh, present leaders. Sadat, great leader? Definitely. Definitely. I told you before, I think he was a great leader, um, quite, a, quite an actor, but a great leader. Mubarak? Definitely. Hussein? They're different, different, different personalities. Different, different personalities. I once said to, 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 to President Sadat, who was sitting in Ismailia, his wife, my wife, and the head of Egyptian intelligence, and I told him that when Mr. Begin and he decided to go into politics, the theater lost two great actors. Hussein? I never met him. He's a survivor. But uh, in this situation, to survive like this, you have to be a tough cookie. By the way, he flies airplanes, too. Arafat doesn't fly airplanes. Have any thoughts about him? I don't know yet. I, for me to be able to pass an opinion, I want to talk to the man. I want to sit down. How could I pass an opinion about, about Sadat? I could have, have done it if I hadn't talked to him. If I would have gone by intelligent files and what they thought of Sadat, wow. Schultz. George Schultz. Look, I'd rather, I'd rather not go and be an analyst of, uh, of friends. I met Mr. Schultz several times. I think he's... Now, leave me alone. He's an honest, uh, 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 interesting man, and he proved his mettle in the last decision. I think the one interesting thing about Schultz, though, is that when he entered office, the American Jewish community was petrified. They thought he was Bechtel, Bechtelized yes. and everything, and... Uh, I attended a uh, function the other week where he gave ten thousand dollars to Tel Aviv University and received an honorary doctorate. Leon, so which only proves to you again: don't have preconceived ideas about anybody. Have an open mind. Feel yourself secured enough to talk to anyone, and find out for yourself whether he is an SOB, yay or nay. That's all. Jimmy Carter. Now I'm prejudiced about. Jimmy Carter, because uh, he's a president that contributed. He's the not most your relative. Why are you prejudiced? Because I think that some of my brethren think differently of him. They think he's done, he's done, he's done uh, uh, some misdeeds to the, to the state of Israel. I thought that he went out of his way, out of his way, to use his influence personally and as to, obviously as president of the United States to conclude the peace between Egypt and us. And, and, and on that he went out of his way. It could be that this was also part of the reasons why then he lost his presidency because he put so much attention to world politics and to, to have this part of the world, a quiet part of the world. I know you had a complex relationship with Begin, <coughs> Menachem Begin. Your feelings about Begin today? It happens to quite a lot of people that you achieve certain, could happen to me too, I don't know, that you have a certain uh, achievements in life and then either you change, the situation changes, or you just uh, uh, shut off all your ammunition. He was great in achieving peace between us and Egypt. He was very wrong in pursuing it. He is, uh, it's, it's easy to bring children to this world, very difficult to bring them up. And he brought a peace child to the world and didn't bring it up. Your brother-in-law, Moshe Dayan. Uh, I had a little nephew who was now he's a big boy. And first time, he was in, in my, at my home, it must have been some 30 years ago, and Diane walked in. Diane was my brother-in-law. His first wife is, is my sister's, uh, is, my, is the sister of my wife. Anyhow, Diane walked in with his black patch, and this little boy, six years old, grabbed the arm of his mother and says, Mommy, the real Captain Hook. 
Was he helpful in Camp David? Definitely, 100%. 100%. The old prophet, Ben Gurion, feelings about him? Well, you have to understand that our relationship with Ben Gurion is completely different to our relationship now with leaders. Age difference between, Ms. for instance, Mr. Begin and us, and our generation is only 10 years. Well, the difference of, of age between BG and us was about 30 years. And he was the f- almost the founder of the state, and he was the first leader of the state, the first defense minister. He appointed me as commander of the Air Force. Uh, we all, I think he was a, a great fellow, um, a great thinker, and, and a great leader. And like all great leaders, made terrific things and a few mistakes too. Hazel, hey, so you're one of the few uh, Palestinians at that point who flew in the RAF. I flew as a Palestinian, that's and right. And Winston Churchill was allegedly your leader. What, what were your feelings about Churchill? There Ooh, was, it was Churchill, there was I. Um, well, I. If we talked about heroes a few, a few minutes ago, um, I just talked about, uh, about generals, and then we switched off to, to, to political leaders of today. I am trying to read as much as I can on everything that was written about, uh, about Churchill, because I think he was one of the great leaders of the Western world, of the world. I've completed only a few months ago uh, one of the late, latest biographies by uh, William Manchester, The Last Lion. Great book, great book. And uh, when you read his books that he wrote, for instance, The River Battle, about the battles in Sudan in 1895, or the Boer War, there's a man who knew battle, who knew life, who had a poetic uh, uh, soul by writing books and what is it Tolstoy said about Pushkin when he was asked he said that anyone who writes poetry hasn't got the ability to write correct prose and uh, Churchill was a great writer a great leader and, and, and a great man and did like a, were, uh, did like a little thought from time to time which is also very important when you were in the RAF and uh, Churchill would address the nation were, were the people really um, oh, they were moved huh? yes as his famous speeches after Dunkirk, his famous speeches in the Battle of Britain. Never so many owed so much to so few. There were sayings like this. It's only a man like Churchill who could have, could have uh, produced them. And uh, I can quote you 101 sayings of, of, of Churchill. You once told me one of your great heroes was Napoleon. Yes, you have a good memory. That's, that's right. I, um, again, a few weeks ago, I completed a book about Napoleon but specifically about his campaigns in the Middle East, in Egypt. It's uh, titled uh, Bonaparte in, uh, in Egypt, written by a gentleman called Harold, H-E-R. And it's a fascinating book. There's a man 30 years old, takes 55,000 Frenchmen, not in uh, Boeing 747s, but in canoes from Toulon, sails for about 35 days, lands in Alexandria, but with him he has there's not, on, not only an army, scientists, doctors, uh, astrologists, um, you name it, he had it with him. And he, due to his campaign and his vision, new archaeology and new studies of, of Egyptology started then. Hieroglyphs were started by, uh, by him, them finding the stone of Rosetta, which was found as, as, as a result of uh, Napoleon's campaigns in Egypt. Not everything was nice there. There was a very, very cruel battle, a very, very, uh, uh, a very difficult one. He had more, more people, more of his soldiers die of plague and eye trouble than in battle. But uh, I thought that he was a, a man again, so a, a cruel when a man on one side, but a man with great visions on the other side. You go to Paris, and Paris is full of Napoleon. You know, back to your uh, comments before on MacArthur, most students in America uh, know more about his military victories than they do about his rebuilding of uh, Japan. Japan, especially yes. I took history in the United States. Would you like to be remembered more for your battle of peace or on your eagle's wings, your Air Force days or your peace with... No, 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 definitely for both of them, definitely for both of them because they're linked together. We wouldn't have achieved peace had we not proved to them and to us that we... we uh, we have to, uh, what is it you say in America, the right stuff. If full autonomy were given to the Palestinians and they establish <laughs> some kind of entity, mm-hmm. how do you visualize that? Uh, first of all, there has to be free elections on the Western Bank in Gaza for them to, to elect their own leaders. 
And uh, I'll quote Mr. Begin in one, one of the interesting things in his speech was that when he talked about elections to the uh, administrative council, and the big problem was then, is the PLO going to be represented, yes or no? And he's in, in the speech he said, and I can show you the speech, I have it here, and he said, if anyone of the organization known as the PLO will be elected, he's elected, let him be elected. In Hebrew, it came out more uh, sort of Yiddish-like. Um, and uh, again, but he added on, but if they carry on terrorism, blah, 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 we shall go down on there. But there was an acceptance in a free election in the Western Bank, that even someone who's a known PLO will be elected, he'll be accepted. And therefore, the first step towards uh, uh, an, an attempt at autonomy is free elections in the Western Bank and Gaza, regardless who is elected, and then uh, um, let them run their own lives. How about defense and foreign ministry? No, no, we're not talking about statehood, we're talking about autonomy, so, so foreign ministry, definitely not. And, and defense, if there's peace and quiet in the Western Bank, as little as possible uh, coming to Israeli army and, and Arab citizens there, as, as little as, as possible in, into contact. But definitely, as long as there's no solution, a, a final status or a permanent solution um, in the Western Bank in Gaza, we are going to keep our forces there. One of your, the one of your prominent colleagues and a leader of the, the nation today told me yesterday that if... Uh, real concessions were made on the West Bank and obviously Jerusalem, which we discussed before, there is a possibility of a civil war in this country. Do you believe that? I hope not. I hope not, but uh, this uh, adds on to what we've to discuss before, that this is a far more difficult solution than the one with, this, uh, with the Egyptians and the Sinai. Um, again, for solving problems like this, you need strong leadership. You need a leader that will bang on the table and say you need a De Gaulle, you need a Gorbachev, you need a, a, an Iron Lady. And right now there's a lot to be desired. Now we are like the old British saying, what is a camel? You know what is a camel? A horse designed by a committee. Thank you, Asa Weitzman. Okay, thanks, Asa. It's a good saying, a horse designed by a committee. It's a good ending. Huh? It's a good ending. It's a good ending. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accords. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Named by the Foreign Policy Association as one of the top five documentaries of 2011. DVD now available on Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available exclusively from the publisher. Learn how groundbreaking history was made behind the scenes. Get the book for $19.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling, or the 10-disc set audiobook for $34.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling. Call Barricade Books at 201-944-7600. That's 201-944-7600. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels now. Thank <laughs> you.